Hey guys, Brian here from Better Chest Training. And in today's video, we are going to be having a conversation with Australian champion, Grandmaster Max Illingworth. Uh, check it out. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation and I hope you do too. Okay. You know what? Uh, it is my honor to have uh, Max Illingworth, a uh, grandmaster from Australia, and a current Australian champion? Or so basically, Brian, I'm the current uh, Australian chess champion. Uh, I'm also a former Australian chess champion because <laughs> I won it uh, back in 2014. Oh, awesome. So all of those were correct. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Yeah. Well, uh, and, and I, I knew that. I just wasn't sure if you had won it multiple times. I didn't want to uh, disrespect you there. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, well, okay, so this, this is a great starting point. Uh, why don't we, uh, what I'd like to, I think what our viewers would love to see, hear about is, uh, you know, how did you start out in chess and, you know, from where you were, obviously, and, and do now. So did you start as a, a child or when did you learn chess? Uh, that's right, Brian. I uh, started out uh, at six years of age, and the way it started for me with chess was that I was on this trip uh, in Europe uh, with my parents, and in Salzburg, Vienna, I saw this giant chess set oh. where there were these old men playing chess uh, as such, and I was immediately transfixed and fascinated by uh, chess. I told my mum that I really wanted to learn it, because basically, before that, I was already very good at uh, board games and strategy games. Okay. Well, I would actually often beat my parents at these games when I was three to five years of age. So for me, chess was a very natural sort of area to progress into and you know, pursue my love of chess in that way. Uh, in terms of when I got competitive, basically it all started for me at eight years of age when I saw another younger kid win my tournament with a perfect score. So what I did oh. then was I actually bought uh, I bought a whole set of chess books. I bought the whole of Yasser Serawan's Play oh. Winning Chess series. <laughs> it's one of my favorite tactics. series. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. that's awesome. Yeah, I mentioned uh, Grandmaster Serawan many times on this channel. That's awesome. Uh, and so did you um, – so your parents were very supportive of your uh, chess. Did you play did, – did, is that who you played a lot when you first started out before you started getting into uh, tournaments and such? Well, for me, I joined a chess club, a oh, okay. junior chess club, very soon after joining. Oh, um, but yes, my parents were indeed very supportive, and I think a large part of my success is definitely due to the fact I had that consistent coaching from nine to about 23 years of age. Okay. That really gave me that foundation and necessary feedback and support to get to next level and you know, learn things that would not be so easy to learn uh, on my own. Mm -hmm. um, and also having my coaches as good role models as well, that was really a big influence and I think a significant reason why I'm able to coach at the level I am today. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, we're going to definitely talk about your coaching. I want to hear more about that. Uh, tell me a little bit, so this uh, coaching uh, relationship, you, have you had, did you have multiple coaches from, you know, like you said, from age 9 to uh, 23 or so? Uh, how, did that, how did that all start out? Uh, well, it's a really nice story actually, Brian, where oh, I, the... my ninth birthday – I wanted to get a lesson from a grandmaster as my birthday present, but the only grandmasters in Australia at that time were uh, Ian Rogers, who mm -hmm. I think was either overseas or just not taking students at that time, mm -hmm. and Dal Johansson, who was in Melbourne. So my mum found I am John Paul Wallace, who uh, yeah, he became the Australian Open champion uh, not long after that, uh, basically asking about chess lessons for me. And John Paul's initial response was, oh, I don't really teach beginners. So mm -hmm. then my mum said, well, Max has read the whole of the Play Winning Chess series. I was only eight years old at yeah. this time. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I understand all of it. So then uh, he said, I've got to see this kid. And that's sort of how it all started from there. <laughs> oh, that's and great. I actually, I actually told Yasser this story at the Olympiad uh, as well uh, oh. last year. And, yeah, he was quite moved by it. So it was really great to have it come full circle in that sort well, of Well, I definitely, uh, it's, it's a book series I recommend. As it's, I think it's a great foundation, and, and obviously it was for you. So, uh, so uh, viewers, that's an that's a endorsement. You don't just have to take my word for um, it. So one of the things I always like to talk about, and I mentioned this to you before, is, is how we get over 
and I know you've talked about this too. Uh, Max is uh, very active on Facebook with uh, chess, and and I've re I read a lot of your posts uh, ever since we met, and, and it's very insightful. When it comes to uh, you know chess is. Uh, you know, it sounds like you've had a great foundation, but obviously there's a lot of learning in terms of uh, losing and struggling. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about maybe a struggle you had early on or anywhere along your path? Maybe one from when you were younger and then maybe we can talk about as you got become came more uh, in the higher levels as well. Uh, certainly. So for me, the first major plateau I reached was probably at about the 1800 level. And I think a lot of that was because of, you know, starting high school and, you know, basically finding that, basically trying new things, uh, trying new openings and trying to learn lots of new things myself, uh, as well as what my uh, coach was showing me. And I think, yeah, just this whole learning process where I sort of had to adjust to a completely new sort of environment, essentially. And therefore, chess, I couldn't talk give chess the energy I wanted at this time and I had to learn you know, how to go from being in sort of aspiring junior to one of the best trying to win different tournaments right. that I was playing. Um, so I think for me that's a lot of it was just uh, building that experience and okay. kind of maturing as a person, learning how to handle a different adversity that was uh, coming across through, uh, through chess and other things. Mm. Um, in fact, I think that's a big thing to keep in mind when you're when you have your own challenges in chess that, you know, when you feel like you're struggling or when you feel that there's some problem that you don't quite see a solution, that's actually when the real growth happens where yeah. it's one thing I've found that often you have to get a little bit worse sometimes before you make that big improvement. And actually the last four weeks are probably a model example of this in my case. Oh, uh, But basically I would say, yeah, that a way I got over was just sort of not giving up. But if I had to mention one single book that sort of helped, I think that getting a structured way of thinking using Andy Saltz's How to Choose a Chess Move, that okay. was sort of the turning point from like being stuck in the 1800s, just searching up to 2100 very quickly, huh. along with all the existing practice I'd done before that. Okay. Well, so would you say that, uh, well, by the way, guys, I'm going to put the links to those uh, books. Any, any books that uh, Max mentions, I'm going to put links in the description below. You can check that out. Uh, would you say that, um, even though you, like you said, the, you had that, that book that helped you through and Now your coach was working with you too at this point. Is that, is that true? Uh, yes. Uh, to clarify, actually had three main coaches in this oh, okay. uh, time period of four years. I uh, was John Paul Wallace for about one year, uh, Brett Tyndall for about four years, and Ian Rogers for the next six or so years after that. In terms of... Uh, guiding you through through that and I don't want to spend too much time on this but I think it's an important part because I think a lot of uh, I know myself you know we've been and partly you know having kids and a family and stuff it's difficult to get the uh, study time in but uh, it's um, some people are get stuck at certain levels and for me it was kind of the uh, well for me right now I, I'm sort of I think I'm maybe on that way up going to struggle through that kind of 18 to 1900 level as well so would you uh, did your, your coach help you with any of um, was it mainly chess uh, instruction in terms of, or did he help you with any of the psychological or the uh, kind of the goal setting type of? Uh, with my coaches, they mostly stuck to chess content and okay. you know, basically just wanted to give me like the best uh, sort of tools I could at that in that respect. Mm -hmm. I okay. think in terms of chess psychology, they certainly tried their best, but I think that uh, you know, there were cases where you just, you know, they're not experts in that field and, you know, there's right. only so much they so helped me in that area. Um, I mean, they absolutely helped me tremendously in terms of, you know, being great role models and you know, seeing what it sort of takes to get to the level that they're at and, you know, the sort of clarity of thought they had when it came to how they approach chess. But I think that, yeah, in terms of psychology, that's something I'm, you know, really spending a lot of my spare time, you know, researching yeah. psychology behind, you know, not just the competition, but also the training and, a general mindset and you know I think that's a massive opportunity for coaches and you know I even said in a chess.com interview just uh, last week I believe that basically I think in five to ten years time you know students are going to actually expect this of coaches that mm -hmm. will be able to not just see what chess challenges you're facing but also what areas of your life might be holding you back from achieving your chess goals you know how you might be able to shift your approach or shift your habits to basically achieve the 
the success that you're after much more quickly. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. I, I think that it's a very important area. I mean, you look at all, all. I mean, chess, is, especially on the competitive level, I think is, is definitely a sport. And so there's sporting aspects just to any any other uh, uh, athletic endeavor, whether it be a physical one like uh, basketball or, or football or, or or a mental one. So uh, and, and maybe we'll we'll, uh, we'll talk about that a little more when we get to your to your uh, uh, coaching and, and and what you're doing. But I just kind of want to focus on your journey just for a couple more minutes here. Uh, so that was sort of uh, in your high school years, right? The that kind of 1800 plateau. Now you said you shot up to about 2100, uh, and and then now you're a grandmaster, so quite a bit higher than 2100. So what, can we talk a little bit about that period and and kind of uh, any hurdles or, or are there any? Well, actually, here's a quick question: How do your um, studying and training change from uh, say 1800 and below to say 2100 and your journey towards grandmaster? Because Okay, uh, so it feels to me like quite a few different uh, points. Yeah. <laughs> but I think in terms of the improvement, I would say that, uh, well, basically at the, almost every level I found my biggest improvement did tend to come when I was solving uh, puzzles in the right way. Okay. So, I mean, not just solving puzzles just uh, from any resource, but solving them A, by theme. So just working throughout one theme until you've got through all the, the puzzles there. Okay. And B, then repeating those puzzles. So you can kind of drill the patterns so they become automatic, much oh, yes. like one will drill math problems in order to have you know, the solutions and process become automatic, mm -hmm. that you don't need to think about it, it's just instantaneous. So that would probably be our main general suggestion, I think, applies across the rating ranges. Okay. But more specifically, I would say that below a certain level, maybe, say, 2100, the key is just to make sure you're doing the basics very well mm -hmm. because it's not some long variation that you're kind of, you know, missing that's costing you the game. It's right. just like little things like making some small blunder at some point. Or, um, and also at a high level, what I sort of found is it does become more individualized where it's much harder just to follow a specific curriculum at a higher level where you sort of need that guidance a little bit more to have sort of another set of eyes to see, okay, this is what you're sort of missing or this is what you need to do to get from where you are to that next really high level. Uh, in terms of the books, I think it's one thing I'd say that uh, it's sort of ironic because I actually have written a, a book myself. Yes. But I feel that a lot of books kind of are aimed more at giving knowledge rather than giving skills, if that makes sense. Yes. And I think so. that a book that you know, is focused on you know, what is the problem you're facing, you know, whether it's making too many assumptions during the game or you know, whether you're not thinking about the pawn structure at all in your decision making, I think something that focuses on specific problems and then giving the solution is all much more useful than just trying to fill your head with knowledge and not understanding how to apply it or not getting the practical opportunity to apply what you're, uh, what you're learning. Because uh, also with some puzzle books, what can happen is you might even get the wrong lessons sometimes or like uh, try to apply some. In terms of your current uh, situation now you're still are you still actively uh, playing obviously you you, you are the current uh, Australian uh, uh, champion um, what is your current uh, I guess uh, ambitions or, or goals as a, as a player and then we'll, we'll get to the coaching but as a, as a player what are you looking to do uh, yeah it's a kind of funny question Brian because uh, actually I sort of announced my retirement from competitive chess uh, a couple of months ago oh and <laughs> and the reason that I retired was basically because I realized I wasn't really enjoying playing anymore mm. for the last year or a bit more. Basically, after the Australian championship that I won with a you know, record equaling score, uh, that was sort of when I, after that, I sort of stopped enjoying playing so much. It stopped okay. being so interesting for me. And I think oh. I became much more focus on sort of helping people in general and you know being able to help people with their chess which is after all my main uh, area of expertise at the moment so for me yeah in terms of my ambitions yeah basically it's to try help people as much yeah. as possible help as many people as possible and you know, i guess that ties in with your uh, coaching question you want to yeah ask. yeah no we'll uh, we'll shift over to that let me well uh, so is it just that is it more of the just the competitive Part of that, that you're just kind of tired of doing that, or, or is it uh, uh, more of a shift? Is it more of a shift towards really wanting to help people through your coaching? Then, 
kind of prompted this? I think it's partly a shift, but it's also partly just sort of I was getting very bored when I was Mm. kind of playing. Um, Like the game just sort of just be like going on for a while and I noticed more and more I was kind of playing quite quickly and it was like I was almost instinctively just wanting to kind of get the game over with Ah. because I was enjoying the social aspect of talking to people at tournaments and you know, sort of understanding their situation and you know, listening to them intently. Interesting. I was enjoying that much more than the actual playing. Hmm. And even now I don't really play that much Blitz because I realise I'm sort of almost always like feeling upset after a, you know, after <laughs> a Blitz game. And I realise this probably wasn't very healthy for me to uh, you know, engage in this sort of psychedelic style activity. You want to throw your la- your uh, computer across the room after a- <laughs> after a blitz game? Uh, okay, well let's uh, let me let's pivot over towards the coaching because I, I we we discussed this before and, and so you would um, just to clarify for our viewers uh, that is your profession. You're a, basically a chess coach full time at this moment. Then, Ah, uh, yes, that's correct. I'm uh, coaching chess, and I also am um, writing some books at the moment as well. Okay, wonderful. Okay, we'll see. Maybe we'll get to that as well. Do you have, uh, well, let's see, is there a certain level of player that you coach, or does it span a bunch of levels? Tell, uh, tell us about maybe uh, your um, your student demographic, I guess. Certainly. Uh, actually, my range of uh, students I coach is very diverse. For me, what I'm looking for is not so much a specific level or a specific age, but I'm looking for that really strong passion mm-hmm. for chess. I just really big desire to improve at it. And also this sort of willingness to learn, you know, being uh, sort of ready as a student, I guess, to, uh, you know, to sort of follow some of my suggestions and cool. basically yeah, be very receptive in general as a student uh, okay. and also to be involved and ask good questions. Those are qualities I'm really looking for in my private students. I see. Because after all, I can't take all of the uh, requests I get. I have right. to pick the ones that I feel I can help the most and who I can have the best connection with in general. Okay, wonderful. Uh, do, you, uh, do you have a specific uh, approach or philosophy behind how you teach? Uh, yes, I do, uh, Brian. For me, it's extremely simple. It's just... You know, listen to the student, you know, try to understand exactly what their challenges are. Uh, I do this even before the first lesson when they ask me uh, about my chess coaching, ask them you know, various questions to sort of elicit the you know, responses and information about themselves. I need to help them as much as possible. And then when I kind of understand what their challenges are that they're facing, I basically then am going to give them exactly the solution and the feedback that they need. I told show them how to kind of apply it themselves in their training and in their own games, uh, okay. a bit with you know specific resources or specific thinking techniques or or uh, other ways uh, of you know helping them as such. So for me, that's the basic kind of approach, and you know make sure to you know, be very well prepared, obviously, and you know be able to answer their questions mm-hmm. and you know, give them the opportunity to kind of also like direct the lesson in the ways that they feel are really important to them. Right. Uh, where they feel they need some help uh, and not sort of uh, able to find the answers easily themselves, if that makes okay. sense. So is most of your coaching uh, online? Or is it I no- do virtually all my coaching uh, online. Okay. And a big reason for that is not just the location, but actually I found that online just has many big advantages. For example, the opportunity to save everything that's in the lesson, oh, yeah. to write notes that are saved in the lesson. Uh, it just makes a much more powerful lesson if they can sort of review it and uh, not relying solely on the interpretation of what I said, you know, right off the right at the moment I said it. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Do you? Uh, I, so, if I could ask you about um, how you developed your coaching method, is it sort of? Uh, did you pick things up from your coaches along the way, or kind of uh, looked at how you thought the ideal coaching uh, situation? How did you develop your coaching style? Yeah, this is quite an involved question um, in some ways. I think that initially I sort of started seeing what my other coaches had done well and try my best to apply that as I built up experience. But I think now that I've actually coached, uh, I think I've actually coached for about 10,000 hours now, actually. Wow, oh, the magic, uh, yes. the magic number, huh? <laughs> yes. So I think for me now, and this has been the case, I think, for a bit of time now, my focus has you know, always been on giving the best lesson I possibly can, 
but now I'm sort of moving more towards learning about sort of coaching theory in general. Okay. And basically sort of trying to help people as much from the, if like non-chess perspective, taking ideas from be it, you know, life, uh, be it self-improvement right. or, uh, or sports psychology. Um, and basically that's why I find I already have a lot of chess knowledge and, you know, say going to a, for a 2500, 2600 level will probably not make a big difference to the majority of people. But what I can do is I can learn a lot more about other fields, see the relevance between that and chess, and then sort of bring that to my students mm -hmm. in a way to bring about results where maybe other you know, coaches may not have that level of expertise or uh, knowledge to solve uh, you know, maybe non-chess problems that are affecting someone's performance. Ah. You know, that uh, it kind of sparks... Uh, it's very well. I know we. That's one of the things we had in common was looking at at some of the uh, personal development and sports psychology, uh, and, and kind of bringing it into our uh, our. Well, for me, for my own chess development, but for you with your your students, contrast mistakes you made early in your coaching career to how your how that's changed you as a coach. Hmm. Yes, uh, sure. Um, it's a very good question, Brian, and you know, sort of in a way, what I've always. Kind of been asking myself, you know, how can I, uh, you know, do an even better job as such and help my students even more. I think for me, the biggest single shift I can sort of think of was sort of understanding the power of silence, understanding the power of actually listening to my student, let them fully, uh, you know, say their their idea of uh, what they want to say, and you know, basically get yeah, giving them the opportunity to you know, actually tell me what there are challenges because that's really the most valuable information I think that they can possibly give me. Uh, so I think that was the biggest shift. And I think that really came when I sort of moved from kind of seeing coaching as a way to support myself playing to something I actually really you know, love doing. Um, I've always had the love for coaching, but when it became more singular, I became more singularly focused on it. I think that was a big change. And you know, I was completely focused on helping the student and, you know, for me, chess is more, so I was sort of curious about rather than constantly thinking, well, how do I get better at chess? So I think that was the biggest shift for me. It became less about me and completely about them as such. Mm. So when I do share my own experience, it's from the perspective purely of helping them rather than to uh, try to boost my own ego or, uh, or something like this. So I think that was the biggest sort of single shift. And yeah, basically, I think that's the, the main thing, just this sort of constant willingness to learn and to try yeah. to improve. Yeah. Um, I mean, basically with chess coaching, the thing is there isn't really any serious system for uh, you know, actually how to become a better coach with chess because uh, with the FIDE trainers exams, you know, everyone has a different style and have to fit to a certain curriculum that you know, may not cover some more subjective elements of chess right. coaching. So for me, that was a thing I had to learn nearly everything from my own experience. But when I did start actually researching coaching, it really... Allow me to take my coaching from being a good coach to really being very effective and you know, really helping people get the results a lot faster because I could just solve their problem immediately okay. or show them the solution immediately that they had for themselves rather than sort of having to guess or rely on coming up with something off the top of my head as uh, had been the case in the past. Right, right. So are you, I guess it sounds like, and you can correct me or, or, or uh, add to this, you're, you're trying to teach them how to fish instead of, uh, you're giving them the fish, but then you're showing them how to, how, to, how to fish as well for their own games, I guess you could say. I'm not sure if the analogy is a perfect one, but that kind of the, uh, um, instead of, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think a lot of, I've worked with a lot of coaches in the past uh, personally, and some were very focused on, okay, here's what you did wrong, you should have played this instead. Okay, let's look at the next position. And it sounds like you're more looking at what's the core issue, whether it be a thought process issue or as you're studying now more of a, you know, any type of psychological or mindset issue. Is that accurate? What I'm, I don't know if that makes any sense. Now, I understand what you're saying, Brian, that you know, often people get caught in this trap of, you know, either or thinking, you know, either I'll show you the mistakes or I'll show you the process. And it's very easy to forget that you can actually give the students both because, okay. you know, if there isn't some game of theirs to hours, if you're not seeing their thoughts, then, you know, basically you're just purely guessing when you're uh, giving some sort of feedback for them because right. this might not be relevant to them at all. But yeah. if you actually, you know, understand their thought process, if you, you know, listen intently to what they're trying to tell you, 
then you can sort of say, okay, this is how you can change it and go from you know, being okay in this area to really taking it to the next level. Um, and with that also comes sort of being able to relate to the student because for me, I'm very lucky that I have this sort of eidetic memory from a young age. Mm -hmm. So I can sort of remember exactly kind of what happened, uh, what challenges I had and what I did to get ahead of every single rating level. Mm -hmm. So when someone has some problem, I can say, yeah, I had this challenge myself and this is how I overcame it. And knowing why, no doubt, this is how I might suggest that you overcome this challenge with this, uh, you know, A, B, C, or sometimes even it's just the awareness of the problem can sometimes be enough to uh, to resolve it or for them to find a solution that works for them. Awesome. Uh, can you give an example of a student who had a particular issue and then what you suggested and then maybe if how they followed up and how it maybe overcame sort of uh, the, the question about a student overcoming a, 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 um, a, an obstacle that you were able to help them with. Is that something come to mind? Someone come to mind? Yeah, immediately. I think of uh, you know, the most common challenge that, uh, that people have sort of in chess and uh, you know, this is not just an original idea of my own. This is what uh, Jakob Ogard, who's often considered the world's best trainer alive yes. at the moment, uh, this is what he told me at a quality chess training camp I attended last oh. year. He told me that most people's mistakes are basically the result of not looking for alternatives as such, where the key is not so much in not looking more deeply, though that can also be a, a weakness as well for some people, but it's more just sort of not looking broadly, not looking for the candidate moves, as uh, Alexander Kotov would put it. Yep. So therefore the solution to the problem that Jakob uh, gave is basically not to sort of make assumptions because usually when we don't see alternatives is because we made some assumption about the position that is not correct. Uh, for example, he took my piece. I automatically have to take it back. But of course, chess is not checkers. You're not forced to take back as such unless it's your only sort of legal moves in the position, as it were. Yes. Uh, so that's essentially the most common example I use with my students. And I mean, it's one thing to intellectually understand this, that you, know, you have to look for alternatives, but as always with the thinking techniques, you also have to practice it and apply it, uh, not just in lessons, but in your own sort of overall approach. So that's sort of the main sort of example I can think of that is probably most pertinent to the majority of people. Um, I also had one other point as well to that, where I found that well, Jakob told me that with Grandmaster play, that the most common oversight to not looking for the alternatives or not seeing the alternative is on move two, where they miss a key move. But in my work with club players and below, I found that it's actually move one, where they ah. usually miss something as such. Um, and that can be very useful, because then it means you're not wasting time, say, calculating some 10 move variation. You can ask, okay, what might be some other options for me or for my opponent in this position? Oh, yeah. And so that's something that you uh, discuss with your students and help them work through sometimes? Yes, exactly. I mean, this is something that, I mean, if they even take this one thing from my lesson, then already it makes a big difference to their game. Oh, yeah. So I always make sure they really understood it and give them plenty of puzzles to uh, to reinforce this idea. And okay. so sort of if they do, you know, kind of look at it in a very narrow perspective, I can then say, well, okay, this is another way that you can approach the position and this is how you might go about it, just to show them that difference in, uh, in depth of thinking between, say, where they're at and you know, where they eventually want to be. So besides you point them towards other, um, would you say, books and such, or do you actually give them uh, positions that you've created or, or accumulated uh, for them to work on between, between lessons? Uh, I do both, actually. Oh, okay. So what I do is I give them specific book recommendations for relevant topics, but there are some cases where the books may not cover them in the same way that I do I uh, as such, where they might have a different perspective uh, of looking at it. Where, for example, I might just call it candidate moves and not sort of bring the assumptions into it, let's say. So that's what I do. I give them a book recommendation and you know, I do give the, my students homework as well. But I particularly make sure that they kind of understand the concept in the puzzles that I give them in the lesson. Mm -hmm. So when they do this in their own time, it becomes a more automatic process and they've kind of already seen how to do it. Because I think when it comes to improving in general, it's very important to have feedback. Um, yes. I mean, with self-improvement, for example, I was trying to learn for this for over a year and I wasn't really getting 
all that far as such or as far as I would like. But then when I actually got a coach for myself, it really made a big difference. So that's why I'd say if you really want to get good at something, you need the right help and because of the feedback loop of being able to you know, see in real time you know, what uh, it is you can add to your existing uh, skill and, uh, and knowledge, as it were. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Um, so quick, uh, well, so we're recording this in uh, April of 2019. So if you're watching this, uh, you know, next year or something, the answer might be different. So here's the question, Max. Uh, so are you accepting new students still, just in case a viewer is very uh, compelled by, uh, by what we're saying here today? Uh, yes, I'm indeed accepting new students. Um, it is from in the process of working on quite a lot of different projects, okay. and you know, it's never will be some that I'll have to put on hold because at the moment only one person, and right, you know, of course, I only have yeah. so much time and resources. But yeah, this stage I'm accepting uh, okay. new students, and yeah, if you really you know, resonate with uh, you know, with what I'm saying, and you feel that you know it'll be a good fit, and that uh, you know you're really ready to take that next step in your chess and achieve what you're really capable of, then I can absolutely get you there if, as long as you are you know, willing to learn and you know, you're ready to give a, to sort of give a try some of the suggestions that I, that I offer you. Because ultimately this is what I'm sort of completely focused on basically, is trying to help others as much as possible. And you know, I spend a lot of time you know, thinking about it and I'm always learning new things myself, which I think is also very important, uh, a very important quality in a coach. Wonderful. And uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll put I'll put your uh, contact uh, links uh, in the description below, uh, so we don't need to. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk about that offline, and I'll, I'll get those to everybody. So if you guys are uh, interested in talking to Max about that, we're not done yet. We've got a couple more topics to talk about if uh, Max has time. But uh, just wanted to get that out of the way because I'm, I think people are listening to you, and I think some of them may be very compelled by what you're saying. So I wanted to get that out of the way. So you mentioned a few projects. These are chess-related projects, uh, I'm assuming, or some of them are chess-related projects? Um, yeah, actually, there is uh, one non-chess-related one, uh, but so I'm mentioning the chess ones first of all. Okay. Basically, I'm going to be writing uh, a book. Actually, it's going to be another co-authored book, uh, funnily enough. Yeah. Um, so basically, it'll be on you know, how to think better in your games, and you know, hopefully this will end up being a series. I'll also yeah. be writing various e-books for Chessable, because oh, now yes. I have a 32-core computer, actually. And what that means is that, let's say, if you're analyzing with Stockfish on your laptop, well, my computer is, pro is doing the same work 30 uh, times faster, in a sense. So that means you know that the analysis is going to be much more reliable, not just from my human perspective as a grandmaster, but also from the level of depth that my computer can reach at a very high level. Yes. But at the same time, you know, because of my experience coaching, I know what's actually important for people at each rating level. And that's something I really want to uh, top convey in my writing to basically make it as useful as possible and you know, give the audience what they actually need rather than trying to fill their bucket with knowledge in a sense. Right, right. So uh, this, that, well, I, if uh, all of the viewers here on uh, the channel know that I'm a big friend of uh, Chessable and a big fan of them. So uh, that's great. So there's a timeline as to when that's going to... Uh, appear so that we can uh, get you back on here to uh, to take a look at it so basically I'm writing you know these books this year okay. but I'm hoping it'll also be an ongoing process where I can continue writing really good content for Chessable and other publishers in fact I even have this dream of writing a book on the connections between chess and life uh, not so much in the character of how life imitates chess style yeah but a bit more in the direction of Josh Waitzkin's The Art of Learning uh, uh, yes. Two very good books. Yep. Yes. So I'll offer my own sort of perspective of you know, how you can use actual techniques, basically, you know, rather than just giving general advice, say, well, this is sort of the skill you can learn from chess, and this is how to apply in your own life, even if you're not a chess player as such. So that's a project that really excites me, and I'm you know, particularly passionate about as such. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay, well, what I want to do, because I get the, a lot of questions here on the channel about different training methods. So now shifting from your coaching with students to what students can do on their own. So I'm going to, if it's okay with you, I'm going to throw a couple topics at you. And if you want to give me your uh, uh, 30, second, uh, 30 second or one minute little uh, take on it, uh, let me know what you think, okay? Uh, so the first one uh, actually is a question I've had a couple times uh, 
is the importance or lack of importance, I guess, of studying uh, with a physical board as opposed to just on the computer screen. Uh, I have my opinion, but I'd love to hear yours. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, I mean, ultimately, you have to know what's sort of best for yourself in a way. This self-awareness is a large part of what uh, what we can learn from chess, I think. But I would say that I think if you don't do a lot of work on the computer or perhaps the phone, uh, I think you're missing a very big opportunity because basically it's just all very instantaneous. I mean, you're scanning the puzzles, for example, one right. after another, or you can sort of flick through a game and you're not know, dropping pieces or having to go back with the variations. So I think that you know, when you're playing a lot of tournaments, you're getting a lot of board work anyway that way. Okay. So I think that using a physical board is not so important. You can very easily adjust between one and the other as such. At okay. least that was uh, was true for me throughout. Okay. No, I mean, that's the thing what I is, it may take a while. It may take a while to get used to uh, using the sort of digital stuff if you're not uh, so familiar with it. But it just becomes automatic if you just persist. Where I'm at a time in twenty in two thousand five actually, where I was just playing on internet chess club on anchor Sunday or something. And got literally just played non-stop on there for one day. Yeah. And I think I gained 400 Blitz rating points at the end because I just got used to using the, uh, you know, the online interface. And, you know, it's okay. It's true that my eyes were very sore at the end. So I probably went <laughs> out more rationally. But in retrospect, it was probably one of the very best things I did for like, getting used to and getting comfortable with the computer because I never really looked back since then. Okay, wonderful. Okay, that's – well, you know, I, and I think it, it is I, – I think it's great to just – Use the pieces, but I, I, I was, I was, I think the sheer volume of training you can do with with the computer and not having to set up the board every single time, especially for things like tactics, I think is great. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Um, so the next one, uh, going off. The, so uh, I always uh, have debates with people about using the chess engine, especially for now. Um, think about you know, say twenty one hundred or eight twenty two thousand or less, um, in terms of. Uh, overuse of the chess engine or, or let, let me make it more open-ended uh, when in the analytical process say someone plays a game when in the studying their own games should they bring a chess engine in should they start right away as soon as they get home from the tournament or should they look at it on their own and, and i'm going to try to leave it as open-ended as possible so i don't uh, influence your answer or uh, need you in any way sure um so basically i think uh i think the best thing you can do after you've uh, had the game, is to certainly try to learn something from it. It's something that every player should try to do, to learn something from every game they play, okay. because you know, every game is an opportunity as such. Um, I think the best thing you can do is basically to try to learn from a, you know, a stronger player than yourself. Idea with the coaching skill to uh, you know, convey the key lessons uh, you can learn from that game, uh, which I do with my three-step analysis process, which... You can find in various articles I wrote or on uh, the chess.com video series, for example, that I did recently. So I think that's quite important to work with a stronger player and you know, get some sort of feedback from the games. Um, I think that with engine use, I do notice a lot of players get so fixated on the evaluation and don't really understand what it means. So sort of my perspective is that the engine can be a very valuable learning tool, but you have to try to separate it in terms like try to ask questions all the time. If you're not actively involved in asking right. questions, why this move and why not that move, then you're going to get the wrong sort of conclusions. And it's I know, to me it's sort of very obvious, but I think that it's a shift that you know doesn't come automatically for you know for so many people that you probably need the right sort of trainer to show you how it's done uh, in a sense. Yeah, I definitely uh, well I definitely agree with your uh, perspective on that, and I think that. But, um... Here's a common one, uh, real quick on it. What, what's your view on Blitz Chess and people using it as a trading tool? I think what's really good about uh, Blitz, Brian, is that it gives you the opportunity to get experience very quickly uh, in openings as such. And also in end games, because a lot of the games at Club 11 Below don't really get to a sort of end game that's not just clearly winning for one side. So it gives you that very valuable experience. But if you play too much Blitz and... But I might just say more than an hour a day as a, you know, a general sort of idea, though your mileage may vary. But basically, I would say once you're playing more than an hour a day, as uh, you know, I was doing through high school, it'll kind of make your play quite superficial, that when you have to actually go deep into a position, you 
you'll be so used to making instinctual decisions that it may be hard to adjust and, you know, go uh, go far in a position when you really need to see beyond what's on the surface, beyond what you just see automatically. Right. So, uh, yeah, if you want to really develop your calculation, then it's important not to play too much Blitz. Okay. But definitely if you don't play any, then it is, I think, a little bit of a missed opportunity based on also what the young yeah. talent seed states are doing. I mean, nearly all of them are playing Blitz and, you know, they're at the top for a reason, you could say. Right, right. No, I know. I'm always contrasting because I know uh, uh, Bodvinik, like didn't like Blitz at all, or at least in his writings he, he denounced it, but then there's players like uh, Yasser Sirawan and, of course, uh, like Hikaru Nakamura <laughs> who play Blitz all the time and say that was a foundation of their uh, development. So it's uh, it's always uh, a debate, I guess, and, and it sounds like you're kind of middle of the road. You know, some Blitz can be very useful for exposure and practice, uh, yeah, but too much Blitz, can, just like, I guess, too much of most things can uh, not be... Uh, a little detrimental is that would that be an accurate summary yeah i mean this is the idea i mean everything can sort of be used sort of in a sort of supportive way or in a kind of unsupportive way where you know it may well be that you know we've seen things done not so well and then we just write off the whole thing uh when it could be very useful maybe for the right person or you know when done the right way so that's all i'd say i'd agree with okay. brian that's about having a balance having things in moderation as it were because okay. I like, understand why it is that you're doing something. Because when you understand the why, it will stop you getting sort of addicted to it and you know, how to keep perspective in becoming better as a player. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm observing uh, a lot of a lot of uh, development uh, for you, and uh, and I think it sounds like it's going to in your coaching is helping a player to become more self aware of themselves, uh, both for the chess and what they need to learn, as well as uh, how they need to think and and you know mindset and such. I really like that. Uh, so let me, instead of me throwing things at you, um, what are, let's say, two or three activities that a player, um, outside of the coaching, of course, that what are three foundational activities that players should really consider when, uh, uh, with their time outside of, uh, you know, taking lessons and such? Uh, certainly. So I think the, I already mentioned uh, the first two. The, the first one is you know, the uh, learning something from every game, uh, okay. doing your analysis, uh, be it by yourself or, uh, or with a coach, um, though ideally with a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, second would be, uh, yes, the you know, tactics method I recommended of solving by theme and repeating to uh, drill the puzzles and yes. drill the patterns, as it were. And I think the third one I would say, actually I kind of said this one as well, to understand why it is that you're doing things. And I'd ask even the viewers now, why is it that you love chess? Why is it that it's so important for you to improve? Because if you're clear on that, then a lot of the other things like the kind of time management and setting the right goals and having the right competitive habits uh, for your training and for your playing, it all often just comes together if you're not so focused on the result that you can't uh, you know, enjoy chess for it is and, uh, and be grateful for it as such. So that would be probably my three main suggestions. And awesome. Yeah, it's not that original, but I think it's uh, going to really help uh, you know anyone watching this. Okay. Well, uh, with that in mind, uh, in the comments below, guys, uh, put down uh, you know what? Why do you guys love chess? You know, let us know. I, I thought that was a great question. I think that's one that uh, we'd love to see uh, in the interaction here. So that'd be great. Um, okay. Well, you know what? I, I think I've uh, used up. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on. We'll definitely have to have you come on again. Uh, is there any, um, I guess, final, uh, we've had a lot of uh, conversations offline, and I think we'll have to share some of, uh, some of our thoughts uh, in a future video. But uh, for this video, is there any la uh, final, final lesson or final uh, piece of advice you want to give to players or any anything you want to share, really? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind is that chess can sometimes feel like a bit of a lonely sort of sport. Because our improvement journey is you know, ultimately very individual as such. You know, I can't know exactly what it is that you're thinking or what is it, how you're feeling at the moment. So one thing to keep in mind when you're trying to improve and you're getting those obstacles is chance are someone else has had that same challenge you had before and they overcame it. And that's why I think you're having the right help and the right direction really is so beneficial because rather than having to figure it all out for yourself, you can really learn from the expertise and from the experience of somebody else who maybe already had your challenge and found a way to overcome it. So that I think would be my main, uh, my main suggestion as such.
Uh, so yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Well, I uh, really appreciate you have, having uh, having you on today, and uh, I think uh, I think the viewers are going to love the uh, video. Uh, hey guys, I hope you enjoyed uh, that interview. If you want to see more of uh, Max Illingworth's worth, he's got a YouTube channel. I have the link over there. Uh, click on that, check it out. Uh, also in the um, bottom, I've got a link to his Facebook. If you want to contact him, you're interested in maybe some coaching, check that out as well. Okay, see you next time.